Hi everybody, it's Scott again, um, and this is the second episode in the Sengoku series that I am doing. Um, last time I talked about the myth of Bushido and how it's a, a modern invention. Um, did not really exist in the medieval period. And today I want to do some background to the start of the Sengoku period and uh, go into some detail about the Onin War, which was the event that really kicked off the Sengoku period in 1467. Uh, so I mentioned before that I'm interested in the Sengoku period of Japanese history, although I didn't really explain, you know, what is meant by the Sengoku period. Uh, and since I want these videos to be uh, accessible to beginners or, you know, people who have encountered uh, samurai culture, the history of the samurai, or, you know, the Sengoku period itself in popular culture, and want to learn more from about the historical background um, of these things. Um, let me just say that the Sengoku period refers to uh, the years uh, from 1467 with the start of the Onin War uh, up until around 1603 when the uh, Tokugawa clan emerged as the most powerful clan in Japan, re-established uh, a national government um, and were able to enforce a lasting peace um, that lasted really until the end of the 19th century when uh, the Tokugawa clan was finally overthrown uh, by uh, some other clans who wanted to uh, put power back in the hands of uh, the emperor. And uh, why is it, you know, why is the Sengoku period so fascinating? Why is it covered so much in popular culture? And I think the answer um, it sort of has two sides to it. The first being that if you're interested in samurai culture, samurai warfare, samurai battles, the Sengoku period really is the time um, where you have uh, warfare on a national scale, just an unprecedented sort of anarchy and chaos of all against all, the state of nature, if you will. Um, there is no sovereign, there is no central authority, uh, that's able to impose its will and, and bring things back into, um, you know, a peaceful sort of uh, coexistence. Um, it's warlords, it's clans, it's militant religious organizations, it's autonomous villages, um, all uh, in in conflict with one another. Um, and you know, even though you know, in video games especially, it's often presented as you know, whoever unifies the land wins, and that's sort of the goal of everybody. Uh, in reality, um, for the vast majority of people at, in all walks of life during the Sengoku period, it was really a struggle for survival. Um, to pursue unification, to think that you could bring all of Japan back under, um, you know, one polity into one unified um, state, if you will. Um, you would have to be a visionary or a madman or a bit of both to think you could be actually pull that off. And when we talk about uh, Oda Nobunaga, um, the warlord who actually got the ball rolling um, in terms of unification and bringing a, a new order um, to Japan, um, you'll see how he was a very exceptional person, both uh, as a politician um, as well as a military commander. But um, I'm getting ahead of myself, and uh, I really want to focus this time on uh, the events leading up to the Yonin War and helping you to get a sort of understanding of what sort of the political history of Japan from ancient times to uh, the Yonin War in the late uh, 1400s. Uh, so it helps to understand that uh, in terms of political structure, uh, at the very top you have the emperor, who is still around today. Um, and he's always been the most revered and respected individual in Japan. He's considered to be the um, embodiment of the Japanese nation, sort of a god on earth, if you will. Um, and really, up until the 8th or ninth centuries, he was the absolute ruler of Japan. He was the unquestioned uh, absolute monarch whose word was law. Um, but after that point, he sort of faded from relevance until... Eventually, the emperor really became just a figurehead, um, more of a head of state sort of figure, kind of like uh, you know most monarchs are today. In that, 
they have no real authority, they're just a symbol, a living symbol. Um, and the reason is that you have these other clans who rise to prominence, who intrigue and plot and try to assert themselves uh, to gain influence and uh, take all the uh, positions of the imperial court uh, for themselves. And one of the earliest illustrations of this is in the 6th century, when the Soga clan um, succeeds in promoting Buddhism in Japan. Um, before this, uh, Shintoism, which is um, the indigenous sort of folk religion of Japan, uh, it's centered around uh, spirit worship, ancestor worship. Um, basically, if you are uh, going off to start a new business, for example, you might um, you know, do some, some rituals or um, you know, pray to the, the spirit of, of commerce to bless your enterprise and so on. Um, and the Soga clan uh, succeeded in bringing uh, Buddhism from Korea uh, to Japan. And they were able to sort of fit it into Gap Japanese culture by saying, you know, Shintoism is for everyday life, you know, the daily activities that you engage in, asking for blessings for those. Um, Buddhism is more about the next life and, um, you know, learning to live peacefully and cultivate you know, your, your inner Buddha nature so that when you die, you're reborn in the next life as a more enlightened being. And in another video, uh, I'll go more into, uh, you know, religion in Japan, especially during uh, the medieval period. But suffice it to say, this is a huge, you know, political victory for the Soga clan. Uh, when they're able to do this, and uh, they are sort of the big, the top clan in Japan until around the 7th century, when uh, a clan with the help of the emperor at the time manages to overthrow uh, the Soga clan and implement some political reforms, the Taika reforms. And uh, this, this clan that overthrows the Soga clan uh, becomes known as the Fujiwara clan, and they end up playing a very prominent role um, from that point on, uh, and they remain one of the key uh, noble clans. And I should pause here for a minute and kind of draw a distinction between um, kuge, which are these noble houses, um, and the samurai. They're not strictly the same thing. Uh, kuge um, are the, again, nobility. Uh, they tend to, um, you know, intermarry with the imperial bloodline. Um, they're based primarily in Kyoto. They hold uh, imperial offices like the Chamberlain and uh, you know, um, you know, seneschals, those you know, offices of state. Um, and they engage in sort of the luxurious uh, leisure activities that we associate with you know the ancient feudal nobility in in other countries like you know the arts, music, theater, um, you know, cultural pursuits that. Obviously, the peasants um, don't have the time for it, since they're doing all the actual work. Um, now, the samurai are the warrior houses. They're the bouquet. Um, and they're devoted to, again, being a professional army. Uh, they don't really come along um, until much later, in, the, in about the 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries, uh, when you really have the need for an established you know, professional warrior class. And they're a little more rustic, at least in the beginning. They're, they're based in the countryside. They're overseeing the large estates that um, are owned, or, or yeah, or that provide the wealth to the noble families, the noble houses. So uh, from the 7th century on, the Fujiwara are one of the big, uh, basically the new top uh, noble clan in Japan. Uh, in the 9th century, uh, a series of emperors create what are basically cadet branches of the imperial uh, family. And what happens is that, you know, these emperors, they have a wife, they have an empress with them, but they also have concubines, you know, who um, they play around with, have fun with. Um, but this leads to just a plethora of imperial princes and other children running around who are all dependent on the imperial household and uh, the imperial treasury. Um, so in order to sort of trim down the imperial family, uh, these emperors make some of their descendants the heads of new noble houses. And uh, the Minamoto and Taira are two of these. 
and they become <clears throat> two uh, very prominent uh, clans in uh, Japanese politics at this time. So now you have the Fujiwara, the Minamoto, and the Taira. And they're all um, competing with each other. They're all um, you know, in conflict for these high positions and influence at court. Um, but they're also uh, marrying into one another. They're also uh, forming alliances and relationships with each other to support one another. Uh, it becomes very common practice to adopt um, you know, the second or third son of another clan, um, you know, both to treat them as hostages, meaning, you know, the other clan will not step on your toes because you have, you know, one of their sons, but it also has a positive effect in that you can cultivate a relationship with this second or third son who may, by accident or by design, end up becoming the actual inheritor of the new clan's uh, leadership. Um, so even though in some, sometimes in, um, you know, stories, popular stories from this time period, uh, or even history from this time period, historical documents, it may seem like the Minamoto clan or the Taira clan are uniformly opposed to one another. That kind of hides the truth, which is that, you know, just because you're Minamoto does not mean that you are Minamoto do or die. You may actually have allegiances, um, more to the Taira clan and the family members of the Taira clan than to the Minamoto, even though your family name may be uh, Minamoto. Um, so really, now you have three clans all vying with each other. This is where the emperor starts to become less relevant. Um, something that happens during this time as well is the start of the Insei system. Uh, Insei means cloistered rule. And it refers to the practice of emperors stepping aside, going into retirement, um, you know, saying they're going to take on religious vows and go into seclusion, become hermits, contemplate the meaning of life and other you know, religious philosophy, theology, if you will. Uh, but in reality, uh, they're merely uh, allowing a puppet to go onto the throne uh, while they run things from behind the scenes. Um, you know, they still have allies and contacts in the court who are going to carry out their will. They've just sort of removed themselves as the lightning rod um, by being the actual, you know, de jure emperor, but they're still the de facto ruler of Japan. Um, but this also has the effect of really enforcing the idea that the emperor on the throne is a puppet, is a pawn, um, and that, you know, these sort of political games uh, are legitimized. Um, that you no longer have to strictly revere the office. I mean, you still have to pay lip service to it, but in terms of engaging in sort of shady dealings, um, this practice of pretending to, to go into seclusion to be a hermit while still running things from behind the scenes uh, uh, serves to sort of undermine uh, imperial authority even more. Um, so... In the 12th century, the Taira clan is really uh, on top. Um, you know, they dominate uh, the uh, imperial offices. Uh, they've you know, really married uh, a lot of the, rel the family members into the imperial bloodline. Um, and the Minamoto clan, uh, being their rivals, their political rivals, do not like this um, one bit. So in 1180, you have the start of the Genpei War. Um, and it's really, uh, it's, you know, properly seen as being the Minamoto versus the Taira, although, like I said, it's not really as clear-cut as all that. Um, and it's probably, I think, the second most well-known, uh, episode from, um, Japanese history, and, you know, especially when it comes to the samurai. Um, and this is really more of the rise of the samurai period. Um, um, there's still sort of a, a new, uh, nascent, uh, class uh, in the Japanese societal structure. Um, and, you know, I really encourage you, if you want to do research into the Genpei War, it's uh, G-E-N-P-E-I, um, and uh, I believe it's called Tale of the Heke, is a famous uh, sort of uh, document detailing this war. It's very fictionalized, it's um, sort of been embellished by uh, you know, the authors uh, who are writing at a time when 
entertainment was really more of the aim than you know historical realism. Um, it's a bit like the Iliad, I guess, if you, if you want a, a Western uh, analog. Um, so take it with a grain of salt if you read it, and you know there are I'm sure there are plenty of more historical, um, serious academic works out there if you want to to look for them. Um, but to make it a long story short, the Minamoto clan prevails in the end. And in 1192, they established the first uh, shogunate. Uh, and what is, who is the shogun? What's a shogunate? Um, well, basically, it's, it's, shogun means military commander. Um, and it's a bit like sort of the title of generalissimo today, um, a military dictator, if you will. Uh, and uh, it was a temporary title before. It had been used before. Um, you know, in times of crisis, uh, uprisings, rebellions, and so on. And it merely meant that someone was taking on the role of a military dictator to pacify the country. Uh, but the Minamoto make it a permanent office. And, uh, you know, it's basically understood that that's where the real power lies, not with the emperor, but with the shogun and his family and the clans that serve under him, his deputy clans, if you will. Um, you know, and I should also mention that you often hear the term bakufu uh, mentioned when referring to the military governor, government in Japan with the shogun at the top. Uh, bakufu means tent government, and it's both an allusion to the fact that you know when, when armies are out in the field, they, they sleep in tents and so on, but it's also an allusion to the idea that it was meant to be a temporary thing. You know, tents are broken down when they're no longer being used, um, but like I said, this was not meant to be temporary. It was the Minamoto were establishing an institution that would be the means by which they would rule Japan, would rule Japan, uh, while keeping the emperor and the imperial court, um, but purely uh, as more symbolic uh, institutions. Now, unfortunately for the Minamoto, you know, there's a lot of politicking going on um, in trying trying to stay in power. Uh, it's a very uneasy uh, situation. And the result is in that in the 1220s, uh, another clan uh, related to the Taira, uh, called the Hojo, um, seized power. Um, they placed a nine-year-old member of the Fujiwara clan into the position of Shogun. Um, and they really dominate the, the office of uh, the regent. And a regent is someone who rules in the place of a ruler when the ruler is either you know, too young or too ill to, to do the ruling. Um, so you have a series of Hojo regents who are the real sort of powers behind the scenes. So essentially you have a figurehead emperor, you have a puppet shogun, and the real power lies with the Hojo regents. Uh, and this goes on for, for quite a while. Um, in 1281 uh, is when you have the, the famous Mongol invasion of Japan. Uh, they land troops on uh, Kyushu, which is the westernmost island of Japan. Uh, and it's this huge drain on uh, the Hojo government uh, trying to defend uh, against the Mongols. And it's really when you have a, a switch in terms of the samurai, who had previously really been mounted archers up until this point. Um, it's only when they're fighting the Mongols that they switch more to a, uh, a foot soldier uh, type approach, you know, using spears, swords, and so on, uh, and not so much uh, being uh, mounted archers. So, contrary to popular belief, uh, the samurai were not always um, swordsmen or, or spearmen. They were, uh, at one point, uh, uh, archers um, initially. So, you know, the Mongols send their larger force, um, and that's when you have the famous uh, kamikaze incident. It's where we get the term kamikaze from. Um, uh, the Japanese believe that uh, the kami, who are uh, the spirits of Shintoism, um, sent a divine wind, uh, kami being uh, divine or spirit, and kaze being uh, wind, so divine wind. Uh, and it's basically a typhoon that wipes out the armada carrying the Mongol forces to Japan. Uh, so they, you know, the Japanese believe that uh, you know, the, the Shinto gods uh, saved Japan by sending this typhoon. Um, 
So to skip forward a little bit, uh, in 1336 is really uh, when you have a, a big shakeup um, in the Hojo fall from power. Um, what happens is there's an emperor named Go Daigo who wants to lead a restoration of authority uh, back to the uh, office of the emperor. Um, and he uh, allies with this uh, samurai named uh, Kusunoki Masashige. Uh, and even though I sort of talked about in the last episode about how um, you know, Bushido was a myth that did not exist in the medieval period, uh, Kusunoki Masashige is sort of the exception in that he's the embodiment of loyalty till the death, you know, loyal, do or die uh, type of approach, in that he serves Emperor Godaijigo um, without question. And he's really known as a guerrilla warrior in that he fights from the mountains, the forests. He avoids direct battle with uh, the forces of the Hojo um, until Emperor Godaigo, um, you know, insists that he do fight the Hojo army one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and even though he, you know, tries to make this happen um, to, to succeed, uh, Kusunoki Masashige um, is unsuccessful, he's defeated, and uh, forced to commit suicide. Um, so Emperor Godaigo does not succeed in his uh, attempt to restore power to the office of the emperor. Um, another guy who's less honest and less um, acting out of loyalty um, than Kusunoki Masashige is uh, Ashikaga Takauji who initially serves the Hojo, uh, switches to the side of Emperor Godaigo, um, and then when Emperor Godaigo is defeated, um, decides to go into business for himself, and attacks and brings down uh, the Hojo and the old uh, Minamoto shogunate, and establishes his own shogunate, the, the Ashikaga uh, shogunate. And so Ashikaga Takauji is the first uh, Ashikaga shogun. Now, there's, at the beginning, they kind of avoid the same mistakes as the Minamoto, in that they, less, they rely less on politics and being more of an actual dictator. Um, and unfortunately, this does not endear them to a lot of the other clans in Japan. Um, and in 1441, uh, you have the assassination of a shogun. Uh, Ashikagi, or I'm sorry, Ashina, Ashikaga Yoshinari is killed. Um, by the leader of the uh, Akamatsu clan, uh, a guy by the name of Akamatsu uh, Mitsusuke. And the way the story goes is that uh, Yoshinori had developed a reputation for being very arbitrary and dictatorial in his dealings with uh, subordinate clans. Uh, he had a lover who was a member of the Akamatsu clan, but not the, not the ruler of, of the clan. Um, and he wanted to basically remove Akamatsu uh, Mitsusuke as uh, the head of the Akamatsu clan, uh, take away his provinces, and give him, give these things to uh, Yoshinari's uh, lover. Also, uh, the story goes, uh, Akamatsu uh, Mitsusuke uh, was a little person, and Ashikaga Yoshinari, to humiliate Mitsusuke, uh, released monkeys in the presence of Akamatsu uh, Mitsusuke uh, to embarrass him. Uh, so, in a way, Ashikaga uh, Yoshinari dessert was sort of asking for it, uh, if the stories are to be believed. But um, what happens is uh, Akamatsu Mitsusuke invites Yoshinari to a uh, theatrical performance, uh, the type of play uh, called No. It's a bit sort of like uh, a musical, op uh, like an opera type uh, performance uh, from this time period. And uh, they're sitting in a garden, you know, watching the performance. And uh, Mitsusuke has these horses released. And in the confusion, you know, these guards secure the area, put it on lockdown uh, on the pretext of safeguarding, uh, you know, Shogun Ashikaga Yoshinari. Uh, but in reality, they are securing the scene so they can kill Yoshinari, which they do. And after that, Akamatsu uh, Mitsusuke escapes to his home provinces in uh, western Japan. 
And the, idea, the, the mere fact that he was able to escape the capital after killing the shogun uh, suggests to historians that you know, he had a lot of support um, from the other clans in doing this. Um, and if we are to believe that uh, Yoshinari was this unpopular uh, dictator figure, uh, you know, it makes sense. Um, so under the Ashikaga, uh, one of the main sort of subordinate clans that served uh, the Ashikaga were called the Hosokawa. And the Hosokawa clan goes to the Akamatsu provinces to get revenge. Um, but for whatever reason, the head of the Hosokawa says, no, we're going to hold back and wait. Um, and while they're waiting, uh, another clan, the Yamana, uh, come in uh, to the Akamatsu provinces, uh, besiege uh, the castles where uh, the Akamatsu forces are, and you know, get justice for uh, Ashikaga Yoshinari. And this leads to the Yamana uh, rising to prominence at this time. And this really uh, leads to a rivalry between uh, the Yamana clan and the Hosokawa clan under uh, the ha Ashikaga uh, shoguns. So after uh, Yoshinari was killed, um, the position of shogun went to his uh, young son, um, but the son died early, uh, and the next one, uh, the next shogun was Ashikaga Yoshimasa. And what we know about Yoshimasa was that he wasn't much of a politician. In fact, he neglected his, uh, you know, duties as a military commander, as a military dictator, and really was more interested in being a patron of the arts. Um, you know, poetry, part, you know, parties, um, you know, bacchanals is having a good time and really ignoring uh, his obligations as a ruler. Uh, he also apparently neglected having any sons. Um, so in 1460, to sort of you know, secure the succession of the Ashikaga shogunate, uh, Yoshimasa pressures his brother Yoshimi to leave the priesthood. He had become a monk, uh, a Buddhist monk, and to become his heir. Uh, and Yoshimi, you know, finally, uh, you know, reluctantly does this. Um, he's the he's the new heir to the shogunate. Uh, but then, uh, lo and behold, uh, Ashikaga Yoshimasa has a son, and you know, obviously under pressure from his the, the mother, his wife, he uh, names the son, who's named uh, Yoshihisa, uh, as the new heir, um, which does not please uh, Yoshimi at all. And this succession crisis really provides an opportunity for the Yamana and Hosokawa clans um, to oppose one another. Um, the head of the Yamana clan, a guy by the name of Yamana Sozen, uh, who was a monk uh, known as the Red Monk, uh, presumably because you know, he, would, he would lose his temper, or get so angry, and turn red. Uh, and then the, the head of the Hosokawa clan was this guy named Hosokawa uh, Katsumoto, who was also known to be very hot-blooded, short-of-temper type of guy. Um, so now, you know, you have a major succession crisis, but you also have other succession crises going on um, that lead into uh, the Yonin War in 1467. So in addition to the Ashikaga clan, the rulers of Japan at the time, uh, these other clans, the Hatakiyama being one, are also undergo the succession crisis. Um, uh, Hatakiyama uh, Mochakuni dies. Uh, his nephew, uh, Masanaga, was initially the heir. Um, but before he dies, uh, he names uh, Hatakiyama uh, Yoshinori um, as, his, as his heir. And uh, from what we know uh, from historians is that uh, both the Yamana and the Hosokawa, for whatever reason, supported Hatakiyama Masanaga in, in the succession, and uh, because of this, Masanaga prevailed. However, because the, the, the rivalry between the Yamana and the Hosokawa intensified, uh, Yamana Sozen switched his allegiance and support to Hatakayama Yoshinori. Um, so this other succession crisis gets dragged into, into the mix. Uh, meanwhile, another clan, the Shiba, uh, are also having a succession crisis. Uh, Shiba Yoshitoshi uh, had become the ruler of his clan, um, but for whatever reason he had been opposed by his vassals, 
uh, the clans underneath him, uh, especially the Kai, um, and they wanted to uh, uh, remove him. And through sort of insiders in the imperial court and the, the, around the shogun, they were able to um, get him displaced. He basically had to retreat to his mansion in Kyoto, um, in the capital. And uh, meanwhile, you know, the shogun sends Yoshitoshi with an army um, to, the, to the east to sort of pacify um, some clans that had been unruly, some provinces that you know, were unruly, not recognizing uh, shogunal authority. And instead of going where he was supposed to go, uh, Shiba Yoshitoshi goes to the vassals who had had him removed and, uh, you know, tries to, to do away with them. And for this, he's, you know, for disobeying the Shogun, he's banished, and the Shiba goes to uh, Shiba Yosh Yoshikado, who's another member of the, of the Shiba family. And again, it's the same deal. Um, Hosokawa Katsumoto throws his support um, behind uh, Yoshitoshi, um, and uh, Yamana Sozen... Uh, marries uh, Shiba Yoshikado into his family. Um, so suddenly you have all these different succession crises going on across Japan, with uh, Yamana and the Hosokawa taking different opposing sides, merely as a pretext to opposing one another. Um, and really, this is what leads to the, the outbreak of the Onin War in 1467. And it's really a case as uh, in terms of... Uh, the Hosokawa being the party in power, the clan in power, and the Yamana, who had been the clan in power um, after defeating the Yakamatsu, uh, wanting to remove the Hosokawa and retake power. Uh, and I should also, I, I forgot to mention, but in, in, the, in the Ashikaga succession crisis, uh, Hosokawa uh, Katsumoto supports uh, the brother, uh, Yoshimi, who had initially been asked to be the heir, and the Imana support uh, the son of uh, Ashikage Yoshimasa, uh, the young uh, Yoshihisa. So again, in the, in the, in the Ashikage case, uh, you have uh, this opposition uh, to one another. And uh, basically there's this arms race where both the Imana and the Hosokawa are bringing the troops in from their provinces out in the countryside, and bringing them to the capital of Kyoto. And uh, technically, in terms of when there was actual hostilities and clashes in the capital, uh, it's often said that the Hosokawa uh, were the ones that strike first, but this isn't technically true. Um, the Amana uh, technically struck first because um, they supported, uh, in the Atakayama crisis, uh, the upstart uh, Yoshinori. And they attacked uh, unofficially uh, the mansion belonging to Hatakiyama Masanaga, uh, who had prevailed in that in the Hatakiyama crisis. Um, so technically, the Yamana were the ones to strike first, um, but then the Hosokawa directly retaliated against um, the the Yamana. Um, and this is where things get really interesting to me because. Um, there's a book that's really helpful about the Onin War. It's probably the, really the only good resource, uh, and it's called uh, The Onin War uh, by uh, Paul Varley. And you can actually buy it through the Samurai Archives bookstore. Um, it's something like $100 because it is an academic work. It's not meant for popular consumption. Um, if you are a college student like I am, uh, and you have access to a university library or consortium of libraries, I would highly suggest that uh, you, uh, you know, um, borrow it from the library, uh, save some money that way. Um, but if you don't belong to a library um, and you're going to buy it, uh, you might as well support the Samurai Archives website by buying it through their bookstore. But uh, when, uh, so after there's an outbreak of hostilities uh, and Ashikaga Yoshimasa uh, explicitly states that he's going to punish whoever breaks the peace um, and brand them as rebels, um, he 
for whatever reason, starts to favor the Hosokawa. Which is interesting, because if you remember, the Hosokawa supported his brother when Ashikaga uh, Yoshimasa wanted to name his new son Yoshihisa the, the heir. Um, so why, you know, why, why would he suddenly support uh, the guy who was opposing him directly in the succession crisis? And when Varley mentions that in his book, he, you know, it's, there's no reason given. It's just noted that in these, you know, diaries of the nobility at the time and, you know, how the, the chronicles play out, he just does it. And what happens is the Yamana end up being branded as rebels. And my own theory on this is that, like I said, the Hosoka were the, were the party in power. They were the clan in power at the time. And I think Ashikaga and Yoshimasa being sort of this guy who's not really interested in politics, who really just wants to kick back, listen to poetry, drink wine, sake, um, decides, you know what, I'll just preserve the status quo and support the Hosokawa and keep the Yamana from you know, trying to, to upset things. So the Yamana are, are branded as rebels. Um, in the meantime, there's this enormous fighting going on, tremendous just battles going on in the streets of Kyoto between the Hosokawa and the Yamana and um, you know, these clans that are divided against each other. And it's really considered the Civil War period in Kyoto. Um, and it's just very destructive um, street fighting, um, you know, entire blocks being burned down. Um, and there's a lot of resentment on the, on the part of the regular people of Kyoto uh, towards these clans that are using uh, the capital as basically a battlefield. And they start to organize into these very you know, informal defense groups, you know, setting up barricades and, uh, you know, outposts around the city, uh, not really picking any side in this conflict, but merely trying to save the city from this wanton destruction. Um, now, the end result is that the Yamana basically lose. Um, the, the, they, they don't really prevail in terms of any of the errors that they supported in these crises, these section crises that happened. Um, the Hosokawa remain in power. They remain supporters of the Ashikaga shogunate uh, into the Sengoku period. Uh, and when we talk more about the Sengoku period, um, you know, the Hosokawa basically uh, remain uh, the powers in this area around the capital until one of the clans uh, that serve the Hosokawa, the Miyoshi, um, undermine and, and, and sort of overthrow the Hosokawa uh, and establish uh, uh, sort of rule over this area around the capital until they themselves are betrayed by um, Matsunaga Hisahide, who I talked about before in the previous video, uh, who uh, switches his loyalty to Oda Nobunaga before rebelling against uh, Oda Nobunaga in the 1570s. But again, I'm, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. Uh, so there are real no winner. There are no real winners in this in the Onin War. Um, you know, the Hosokawa come the closest. Uh, as to the leaders themselves, uh, Yamana Sozen and uh, Hosokawa Katsumoto. They, uh, they, they both die in the same year from natural causes, um, uh, 1573, and uh, the war continues on, and it sort of just peters out. There's really no decisive end to it. Um, and it's really more of an illustration of how, things, how far things had fallen uh, for the Ashikaga shogunate, uh, because really the succession crisis itself was indicative of the fact that... Uh, you know, instead of just picking an heir, the shogun saying, you know, this person will be the ruler of this clan and they will serve me. Uh, the mere fact that there were these, these crises, these, this, um, this ambiguity about who's the real heir to the clan, uh, serves to show just how far authority had fallen from the Ashikaga shogunate. Uh, you know, Yoshimasa didn't help matters by not really caring about ruling. Um, but, you know, the mere fact that there was any kind of question about you know, who's, who's really in, in, in charge here, uh, just serves to show, you know, how, how, how uh, diminished in authority and status uh, the position of uh, the Ashikaga Shodan had, had fallen. Um, and, you know, Kyoto never really recovers during this period. Um, it's said that 
uh, when people in Kyoto talk about things being destroyed in the war, they're actually referring to the Onan War and not World War II because uh, Kyoto was never bombed uh, during World War II. Um, but the, the Onan War itself was really destructive and really did damage to the idea of power, central power being located in the capital. Um, and so basically what you have happen is that now that there really is no authority anymore in, in the capital or around the Shogun. Uh, these different clans that control these different provinces around Japan start looking out for themselves. And instead of hanging out around the capital, you know, hanging around out around the courts, trying to curry favor, you know, engaging in plots, they return to their home provinces to either defend their provinces against invaders or to act as invaders themselves, trying to uh, spread their influence and claim different domains, because there is no longer any real threat from the central government. Uh, you know, the Yamana and the Hosokawa, by having a civil war and turning Kyoto into a battlefield, have shown that the Ashikaga shogun really has no real power left. Um, so just uh, in closing, um, one of the interesting figures from this period is uh, Ashikaga Yoshimi, the brother, who had left the priesthood to become the heir before uh, Yoshimasa had a son. He actually ends up being, he, uh, Hosok he, like I said, the Hosokawa supported him initially. And for whatever reason, Hosokawa Katsumoto had Yoshimi stay in the same palace as Ashikaga Yoshimasa, Yoshimasa's wife and their son, so they're all living to get together, even though they're in the midst of this huge succession crisis. And Ashikaga Yoshimi, very you know paranoid, rightfully so, about his well-being, flees. And finally, um, he returns to the capital, um, makes amends with his brother. Um, but someone starts a rumor that uh, he's in league with the Hosokawa against the emperor uh, against the shogun. Um, so Hosokawa basically banishes him uh, from the capital, Yoshimi leaves, and he actually falls in with the Yamana and becomes a general of the Yamana um, before he dies. Um, so this poor guy uh, who, you know, just wanted to be a priest, a monk, just to, to live his life out in a temple somewhere, ends up being dragged uh, rather unwillingly into this huge political conflict, and it's just sort of tossed around like a pawn um, for sort of, you know, dying in obscurity as the general of this, of the losing side in this conflict. So that's the Onan War. It really sets the stage for the rest of the Sengoku period, although there is sort of this gap between, you know, 1467 and, you know, the end of, of, the, of the 15th century. Um, between then and sort of 1560 or 1551, when you have a little more activity in terms of, you know, warlords emerging who will go on to really dominate the rest of the Sengoku period and uh, sort of this, this, this time period where unification really uh, becomes a real possibility. Um, and so what I think I'm going to do is, I haven't decided whether I'm going to do some more on, you know, Japanese culture during this time, like the role of women and religion and, and so on, or if I'm just going to jump into sort of biographies about some of the important figures from this time period, uh, like Oda Nobunaga would be the first, obviously, because he was such an important and central figure in the Sengoku period. Um, so, I mean, if you have a preference yourself, please leave a comment either on the Samurai Archives board, where I'm posting links to these, or leave a comment on uh, the YouTube page. And uh, I promise I'll read them and take them into consideration. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, if, again, if you also have any questions or comments, uh, you want to know how, let me know how terrible I am at this. Again, uh, on the Samurai Archives board, under blogs and podcasts, or uh, on the YouTube page. And again, I promise I'll, I'll read them and try not to take them too personally. So uh, have a good day. I'll see you later.